So today we're going to talk about the value of humility and the reality of power as we take a look at the story of Philip and the eunuch from the book of Acts that Craig just read and see how it might help expand how we find our way into this ongoing call to be a reconciling community and participate in mending what is broken among us. So Philip is a follower of Jesus, and he, like many followers of Jesus, has left Jerusalem as the early church is taking shape in Acts and is spreading the gospel all over the place. Now Philip is the one who brings the message and expects folks to listen, accept the message, and then change. That's often how we view evangelism. We have the good thing, we share the good thing, people should accept the good thing, then change, and we get to feel good. And there's some truth to that. We do have something that's good, that's too good to keep to ourselves that we want to share. But there's a shadow side to that as well. It ends up that we feel like it looks like it's communicated that we are converting them. We are saving them. That's how it always was presented to me growing up. We have to go and save the lost. And there's a real imbalance of power there. We are the found, they are the lost. We are the saved, they are the doomed. We fix them. But what if it's not that simple and shouldn't be? Padraig Otuma is a former leader of the Cory Mila community in Northern Ireland. He says that that's often as far as an interpretation of a scripture like this story of the eunuch and Philip goes. Philip's out for a walk comes alongside a carriage, here's a man reading from the scriptures, and Philip is the one with the message that can help. Do you know what you are reading? Oh, you don't? Let me hop in and tell you for a second. And the conversation that ensues, Patrick says, is on the grounds of a converting conversation. And it's no more original than the missionary stories I heard growing up, the ones that were heroic, doing the real work of Jesus, saving lives and counting them. One, two, three, ten, a whole family, a village. Look what I did for Jesus today. In youth ministry circles when I was growing up, people would brag they took this many kids to camp. Fifty, a hundred would give their lives to Jesus. It was all very performative and full of the pride of saving lost souls. But it got disturbing at times. Because it was all about, look at me and what I did. And often what would happen is, these youth would often feel like they had to give their life to Jesus or they would be shunned or disappointed. The youth leader would say things, I remember growing up, I'm disappointed that you didn't give your life to Jesus this week. Have you ever had a parent say that? I'm not mad at you, I'm just disappointed. Have you ever said that? Have you heard that? Somehow that hurts more than when they're angry at you. I'm just disappointed. There's this manipulation. Somewhere growing up, I knew that this messaging of the good news is one that offered no humility, no freedom, no choice. It was a message meant to convert with power over, not a transformation of the heart. It was heavy with agenda. It had an end goal. And the tenor was, you need to accept this message by force or friendship. That happened a lot with youth, people growing up. You get to know this person. Oh, yeah, I want you to come to church. I want you to do this. And as soon as they joined the church, they committed their life to Christ, they said some special prayer, that person's gone. And they begin to wonder, was all of this fake? Was it just to get me to say a few certain words? And this, of course, as Patrick says, over time has affected culture, politics, land, families, relationships, livelihood. The history of the church is often a history of forced conversion. Are you familiar with the doctrine of discovery? There's a fascinating book in our church library. If you go towards the office suite, right on that shelf, as you go towards the office's bottom corner, it's called Unsettling Truths. I'll give you the 10-second recap of the doctrine of discovery. Papal bulls, which are authoritative statements from the Pope, 
of the 15th century gave Christian explorers the right to claim lands they discovered and lay claim to those lands for their Christian monarchs. Any land that was not inhabited by Christians was available to be discovered, claimed, and exploited. If the pagan inhabitants could be converted, they might be spared. If not, they could legally be enslaved or killed with no legal or spiritual consequences. That whole Ten Commandments, not, thou shalt not murder thing, wiped out as long as you are doing it to non-Christians so your king can have more land. Makes sense, right? No. The discovery doctrine was used to promote and justify manifest destiny, westward expansion here in the U.S., and it's actually a concept of public international law expounded by the United States Supreme Court in a series of decisions in 1823. So internationally, legally, you can go and do whatever you want to the native people to expand your country, and if they're not Christian, that's fine. They aren't real people. Church doctrine. Legal Supreme Court doctrine. The world has a history of forced conversion under the guise of it's for your own good. When we were in Ireland, we visited a, a famine ship called the Dumbrody Famine Ship. It's in the Republic of Ireland. Irish people would get on these ships and sail to Canada, to Australia, to the U.S. in search of a new life because there was no food there. Most of the food was being sent to England. Even the lumber was shipped to England. Those ships had to be built in Canada because the Irish wood couldn't be used in Ireland. But what happened is people would be starving. Catholics would be starving, and they could get soup and bread. People would feed them soup and bread if you converted to Protestantism. You want some soup? You want to feed your children? Become a Protestant. Imagine that choice. Change your whole system of belief, your faith, or starve. Watch your children starve. How is that life giving? How is that good news? How is that reconciling? I remember a story in Germany. There was a family desperate for work. They needed work. The father would go and say, I'm a clerk. I know accounting. I can work. And people would, wouldn't get him a job. Finally, in order to get a job, he converted to Christianity. He had been a Jew all his life. He converted to Christianity so he could work and he could feed his family. But he had a son, a son who remembered what this church did, what the society around religion did to their family, and that son's name was Karl Marx. And he remembered. So Padraig offers that perhaps that this is not what this story is really about. It's, it's not about Philip going and, and saving the eunuch, this Ethiopian man. Perhaps instead this story is about a healing, a kind of healing that goes to the roots. And at first glance, it may make sense to think that the Ethiopian man is the one that needs the healing. He's a eunuch. He was likely castrated at a young age, likely against his will and made other in, in gender and in body, regarded as a sexual minority. He's also a high-up official in the Queen of Ethiopia's court. And he's come to Jerusalem, likely a two-month ordeal, to worship. And yet when he arrives at the temple, he can't enter. They don't let him in. In the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 23.1, it says, No one emasculated by crushing or cutting can enter the assembly of the Lord, whether it's on purpose or by accident. If you're a eunuch, you can't enter the temple. You can't be a part of God's people. So he's rejected. He's excluded. The message that has greeted him is he is forbidden to join the family of God. And it seems kind and obvious to offer a different message, one about Jesus to him. And yet the scripture this Ethiopian man is reading is about a lamb who also had a blade held to its body. And the Ethiopian man asks, about whom is this text speaking? Is the prophet speaking about himself or someone different? He asks, is the prophet talking maybe about someone like me? Padre Gotuma says, it's all well and good to talk about sacrificial lambs when you're thinking 
abstractly. But here, though, Philip is being converted as he is brought face to face with a person who in their own body has been brought close to a weapon where a weapon has been pressed against their body. Philip here is being invited to rethink what he thinks he's talking about. Have you ever had to rethink what you're talking about because of an encounter? When you realize, I've been talking, but I don't know what I'm talking about. Happens to me a lot. You see, experience precedes understanding. When I was younger in junior high, high school, I used to have the idea, the idea was put in my head by some of these non-church ministries I was going to that women couldn't possibly lead a church. They couldn't be pastors, they couldn't be elders, they couldn't serve communions. That's what I've been told by many of the youth ministries I've been a part of. Now, I went to denominations who affirmed women's leadership, but I never actually had a female pastor before. And here I was by people who I trusted, I was being told that scripture actually forbid it. And since I'd never actually talked to a woman who felt called to God's ministry, I started sharing some of the same things, talking about the Bible that way to other people. Well, you know, women can't be pastors, it says right here. Until I actually met and talked with women who were leaders of faith and pastors, and the encounters forced me to think differently, I understood. I couldn't believe I'd ever thought differently. It's easy to think about them when you're off in an echo chamber. You can make up any stories you want. When you meet them face to face, the word becomes flesh. It's a little different. It's easy to think one thing in an echo chamber, isolated from the experience of the other. Experience, encounters, precede understanding. That's one of the long-term goals of our Engaged Stories project. Listening, encountering people who are different. Actually letting them tell their stories instead of us telling their stories for them. So the eunuch here is attempting to infuse faith with an encounter, with a face. Asking Philip, how does the scripture that you've read, that you know, translate as you see it in the flesh, in human form? Because here I am, a sheep led to the slaughter, a person humiliated, mocked for being different, a person with no descendants. Where is God? Who is God to you, Philip? And who do you think God is to me? He invites Philip to go back and look at his faith before it becomes reduced to a system of abstractions and beliefs. Because that's what happens to faith sometimes. We make faith up here in abstract land, and we never bring it down and put feet on it, let it get tied to the earth, to the dirt, to the people we're around. Maybe asking Philip, how can you stretch your faith to be a series of stories and as a series of encounters instead of just these ideas in your head? How can you value me and my story? This encounter with me as much as being right about what you've learned about God or faith and scripture. Can you hold relationships as important or more important than the beliefs you've held? Padraig says, this, this Ethiopian man was not the one who was saved that day. He was fine as he was, reading, thinking, asking questions, pursuing his own curiosity and intelligence and interests. No, see, the person that was saved was the person whose imagination was in need of expansion. So here we can witness that Philip, the person who thought that they had the message to give, was the one that needed the message the most themselves. It can seem mostly harmless to tell this story as Philip is being praised for engaging with this Ethiopian man. But when we nestle our understanding of Scripture through the lens of a colonialist mindset, one that values power, control, domination, conversion as a sign of spiritual status or holiness, we injure, we harm, we erase story and people and lives. Healthy faith is always humble about its own holiness and knowledge. It knows that it does not know. We're rarely ever 100% right and almost always partially wrong. 
See, a healthy faith is what the eunuch saves Philip into, into a non-conquering, non-fearful faith, a humble faith, a faith that reminds us that power is demonstrated in the capacity to learn and to adapt and to see and to take in who is in front of you, to enter the prayer tent, the chariot of another upon invitation, especially those that we have othered, and listen, repent, act differently. This is the healing here in Scripture. A healing of the arrogance of an entitled posture, an invitation to a posture of humility and repentance and awareness of our own limitations, of how much we have to learn and unlearn about ourselves, Scripture, God, our neighbors, those who live lives differently than ourselves that we believe we understand and therefore we judge. We think we know them, and therefore are entitled to judge them. There's so much judging in the world today of everyone and everything. We are arrogant enough to so quickly judge as if we have all the facts, all the context, all the insight, all the truth. I've noticed something. When you have these high-profile court cases that people are watching, I see it all the time, before the trial is even done, well, if this verdict doesn't happen, justice won't be done. Well, how can you say that? The trial hasn't happened yet. And I wasn't aware that you were in the courtroom watching all the evidence, listening to all the testimony. What kind of arrogance do we have to say if this doesn't happen, then justice doesn't happen? We don't know. Several years ago, there was an incident at a zoo. A child fell into a gorilla enclosure. And there was all this hubbub, and they had to shoot the gorilla. And suddenly everybody was an expert on zookeeping and game warding. I had no idea so many people had been game wardens in their previous life. Because everyone had an opinion. You know what? You wouldn't believe it. Everyone's opinion was the right one. Who knew? They somehow knew exactly what happens if you tranquilize a gorilla. Or where to shoot a gorilla. What happens if a child gets near a gorilla. They knew all the legal aspects, everything, by just watching the news or watching Facebook. They were experts. Everyone here could probably run their own zoo with no problem. We're arrogant enough to think the world needs our judgment, wants our judgment, and we're in any position to give our judgment. And we're not. And this is the importance, I think, of imagining that Philip is the one healed here. Because it gives all of us followers of Jesus a chance to see that humility is a way forward. Humility is a way to heal the disrepair that's been rippling through Christianity, our society, and world. It is not a value by which we become doormats or silent or apathetic, but it is an essential component by which we keep the face of the other and thereby the face of God in view. We've got to constantly remind ourselves of what we do not know, and that's a whole lot. Instead of clinging to certitudes on every side of every question, could we enter into conversations with humility, curiosity, and openness to unlearn, to listen? Listen to learn, not respond. Listen without expectation that someone will change to our point of view. Just listen with the hope and humility that they may give us a gift, may change us, may open our eyes to something new through this encounter. Now, we don't know exactly how Philip responded to this eunuch's question of who is this scripture about a lamb being slaughtered about? We can imagine that it invoked an internal movement from Philip, from, oh, wait, this could be you, to this is you. The word became flesh indeed. And maybe, maybe then Philip explains some of how he understood the scripture, of of who God has been to him, speaks of his own experience of faith, of what he's challenged by or inspired by. We can gather that something stirred in Philip because eventually the Ethiopian man says, well, here's some water. What's to stop me from being baptized? And if Philip had stuck to the law, if he had followed the book of order, much like the Ethiopian man's temple experience, there would have been a lot to keep him from being baptized. But perhaps Philip knew the power of being more loving than being more right. Perhaps he started prioritizing relationships above belief, which is one way to mend the world. 
Perhaps the law he had read so many times in that same book of Isaiah finally came to life inside of him, where it says, To the eunuchs I will give a name that will not be cut off, a name that will last from generation to generation. Maybe Philip wanted to be at the, a part of that healing, that mending away forward, the naming of a nameless man as a child of God as he comes up from the water. I think we can't mend the world until we can live in it with humility, acknowledging where we've gone wrong and acknowledging we may have it all wrong. It's what God requires to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. This is the way to mend the world. Justice, kindness, humility. All with God. All for God. Not for ourselves. For God and for the love of all God's children. Naming each person we meet exactly as that. A beloved child of God. As we will do shortly for three beautiful children. Beautiful, loved children of God this morning as they come up from the same water as the eunuch, as us, as all the saints. If we can humil with humility name each other, see each other, treat each other as children of God, worthy and able to teach us something and not just be someone we have to heal or fix. Because maybe that's us. Let us pray together. Almighty God, thank you that you are a God with us and for us. A God who calls us to live lives of justice and kindness and of humility. Lord, help us to know that we do not always know. Help us to hold relationships and experiences as important as our beliefs. Because those are the things that inform and change belief. That's why you came to earth and lived among us, so we could experience you, not just think about you. Lord, help us to experience you through each other. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.